everyone, and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This is James Cork, and with me I have Norman Sanso. Welcome to the show. We're here to <sighs> let you know. Shut up. Seriously, no. Don't even dare to do that. <laughs> An an awesome brownie reviewer, Silver Quill. This comic mentions clopping. I find that questionable. <laughs> Well, it's written by Ted Anderson. What did you expect? Um, I remember. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, we're, we're going to be reviewing the Finship is Magic issue number three, focused on the silence, written by Ted Anderson, like I already said, with art by Agnes Garbuska and colors by Heather Breckel. You know how we always do first impressions and we ask, what do you guys think of the comic and all that? Do you mind if I go, if I am the first one this time? Sure. So alphabetical already then? Alphabetical. <laughs> go. Okay. Okay, well, this is what you think of the comic. It... That's not a word! <laughs> Review over, okay, we can all go. Let's get out. Wow. Norman, roll the theme song. <laughs> really? <laughs> Seriously, that, that will be my review on two words. Oh, wow. I, I... I will be, I, I am done with the review right now. You guys take care of it. I don't know what else to say about it. I can, I can uh, go deeper into it when we start reviewing it, but that's my impression. That's what I, that's what I get out of this one. Nothing. <laughs> even more, even less than in the other one. I get nothing. What about you guys? Well, I, I, pff, uh, how do I put this? It's, um, I want, <laughs> how, how do I put this? I won't say it's, okay, it's interesting with what they wanted to do, but the, hmm, how do I put this? Interesting in concept, but poorly executed. <laughs> That's that's yeah. That's my first impression. Silva. When I watched the sirens in Rainbow Rocks, uh, they didn't strike me as terribly deep or interesting characters. They were more dangerous, it seemed, than Sunset's uh, machinations because they had magic on their side, and they were sowing uh, disharmony. But but basically, if you ask me to expand on their characters, uh, one's the leader, one. It wants to use Zerp, but never actually does anything, and one likes tacos. <laughs> and good lord, do they make a meme out of that. This comic actually goes less than that. Wow. Be- because this is before they were stranded. This In this comic, the sirens all seem to be genuine friends. They're facing the challenge together. They're eager. They might have words of caution, but there's no there's no tension between them. And you could say, oh, they probably developed the, the more animosity based on the fact that they were stranded in the human world and maybe blaming one another. But then I need to know more of their dynamic before they were banished mm-hmm. than, uh, than what we see here. There's got to be something to say, hey, they, re- they really changed over that curiously suspect amount of time. The biggest thing, though, is... Two pages. This whole comic builds to what I consider to be the highlight, a two-page spread with some of the best jokes and funniest imagery I've seen in a while. But to get there, I've got a story that I'm really just not invested in. And the ending, my God. It's like, Star Swirl. uh, Uncool, bro. Uncool. So true. Uncool in front of thousands of ponies, by the way. I don't think so. Everybody saw this. I don't think it's in front. It is. Well, it kind of is. It's kind of the backstage where, (sighs) side of the stage, whatever. But, yeah. Either the the most, the most, (laughs) when I saw it in a question, goes, they presented as dramatic, this huge pony whose beard will smother the world uh, is banishing these wicked sirens. It turns out he just gets a cheap shot in. Which I do not appreciate because, from what the story's been told from Twilight's point of view, when she read the history books where the sirens were very dangerous, they had power to control the ponies, and they were very malicious. In here, we just see them very, very... <sighs> shall we, shall we, shall we go yes, on? Yes, please. Because I want to get done with this comic very, very fast because, I mean, okay, there is, there is, there is a tonal issue with this comic book right from the very beginning because the way that they present you this story, the way that they are, they lure you in with it because it, it actually, I will have to admit, it's drawn very well mm-hmm. for the first five or six pages. 
Agnes, Agnes Karpowska is an artist who, to me, she's great with the sketching, she's great with the character design, she's even better with the inks. And every comic that she has drawn and that she's worked on with Ted Anderson has been really good. I mean, the, the pinky, the, I mean, the Spike and Celestia, uh, Friends Forever was awesome. The main hat and Mystery Diamond was also great. And, uh, her work on the Friends Forever with Trixie and Rainbow Dash and the one with Babs and Rarity is gorgeous as well. But there is a problem with the way that the, the story is written that drags onto the art and it influences it for the worst. Because you start with this, the, the way that Equestria is presented. It looks like ancient Greece mixed with ancient Rome, all carriages and, uh, cities with, um, you know, it looks like they look like mausoleums everywhere, temples and all that. And, and it's like, this is a cool recreation. It's a very interesting mixture of cultures, very similar to what we were seeing in, uh, in, in the Hearth's Warming Eve story, how the Pegasi, uh, uh, city was, was presented. I don't know. It's, it's all oh. Greek to me. <laughs> <sighs> oh my gosh. But okay, so it's like, oh, this is brilliant. This is brilliant. Where are we building up to this? We're building up to a parody of American Idol in uh, ancient Rome, ancient Greece with uh, judges and a system of pressing a button and giving an X and say, no, you're out. You're bad. Nobody bats an eye to these floating seahorses walking around and going around. There is apparently Chugam as well. Chugam? Was there Chugam during ancient Greece? And they come up with the idea of pop music. And then they, they start singing and the, the, the songs don't have any rhythm whatsoever and they don't rhyme and they don't go, there is no, there is no melody going for these. These songs are awful. No, seriously, the songs are awful. Every single song in this in this comic is horrible. Well, okay, I go back to the. I go, hang on a minute. I just want to say that going back to the Pinkie Pie micro, where Pinkie Pie starts singing to uh, Pony Atsy and all that, that song had a, re- a rhythm on its own, and you could hear it with the the typical Pinkie Pie music playing in the background. But this one, I don't get nothing of this. There is no consistency. There is no impact, and it ha- doesn't have any weight, and it do- it doesn't get any better as the comic progresses. Here's the problem that a reviewer on Channel Awesome said, uh, Linkara, he said that when a comic includes lyrics to a song, especially if they're original song lyrics, the problem is, to us, the readers, is just written words. They don't have any impact on us because... We got no idea how the tune is. We got no idea how it sounds. To us, it's just words. Like, for example, if I were to read you the song about Welcome to the Show from Rainbow Rocks, it's just, ah, 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 welcome to the show, ah, ah, ah. That's about it. So, for us, it would be really strange in how words can be without the proper context. Yeah, but the context is given to you by the comic itself. Yeah, I know, the but... fact that they go and, came, and come up with pop music in the middle of the ancient Greece, I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. I don't care if this is these are magical, uh, magical floating horses. That's actually kind of weird. That this is the thing that breaks my suspension of disbelief. The way that they are presenting this show and the way that they are presenting you this universe, the inclusion of pop music in this time and time period makes no sense. Mm. And it only gets worse with the so-called music wars, where they say more than 13 different musical uh, musical styles were created during these wars. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm like, so, hang on a minute, we go from rock to country to rap music to uh, quartet music, kind of like quarter barber music, and, and like, Jam and the Holograms reference with what? Double B? Ba- what? Is that, this is a constant, what? <laughs> that, I know that this is, this is the part of the comic that you say was your favorite, Silver, but personally, I don't see it. This is awful. I don't, I, this doesn't add up. For me, it's the, it's the absurdity of it. It's the idea. They're making this truly epic thing where 27 different genres were created in one night. 
and you see Star Swirl. He is a classical violinist. He is a country twanger, double guitar prince. And then perhaps the strangest thing, Star Swirl the Bearded the Rapper is yeah. funnier than a guy who was all hot to trot about having a hydra in his secret lair. <laughs> True. This this is the this is what Ted Anderson needed to do throughout the whole comic. Just throw caution to the wind, let them be all out insane, and just push the absurdity. Up until up until this point, they, they didn't even want to conquer the world. They wanted to feast on negative energy, but it was more about just being popular. Yeah. And that's our 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 menacing villains are they're not brainwashing anyone to the point where they're servants. It's just, we want to be really popular. Oh no, they're Britney Spears. Hmm. Here, here's what I fail to see what the, what the comic did and how the movie represented the sirens. Because in the movie, we clearly can tell that they're dangerous, they have magical powers to abuse, and they did. And if they were successful, they could have, well, conquered the world. In, in Bison Joke here. And, of course, <laughs> and with with this, it's like, what's your threat again? You wanted to become popular and feed on negative energy, and let the ponies fight each other. That's a day in Manhattan. Yeah, that's Perfect. something that doesn't add up. The tone that this was, the tone that this was given, the the way that it's presented. Like I said, it starts so well. It it goes so nicely. Like, yeah, good, ancient Greece, ancient Quest, yeah, we're seeing some of that. And then it goes, it goes like <laughs> some of the worst Leslie Nielsen movies during the last part of his career. Yeah. Like, it goes full, full stupid. It goes a scary movie, it's scary movie two, a scary movie five levels of absurdity. And the most disappointing part was this story could have been good like it this, could have been so good it, like <sighs> I, I, i'm noticing right now we're reviewing the comic but we're not really reviewing the comic we're just we're not really reviewing the comic we don't want to talk about we don't really want to talk about this but this you know what nothing... i'm gonna i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this i am going to bring up the elephant in the room let's mm -hmm. talk about ted anderson for a moment okay all right go ahead yeah i did joke about it on the on the power ponies review all that the whole drama that was going on over the the, the whole ted under something i'm not gonna go into that but i'm just going to say this right away i really like Ted anderson as a writer mm -hmm. i really do i think he wrote some of the most poignant interesting and well-written comics of the entire series his job on the friends forever with rainbow dash and speedfire is masterful I think no one else could have written that comic better. It's just so good and so interesting. And his writing is very natural. He is a good writer. What the hell happened here? Who was behind the wheel on the editing of the story for this comic? Who should we blame? Should we blame Bobby Curno that he didn't see the, the factual errors in the narrative of this comic? Or should we blame Ted Anderson because he wanted to cram in more joke after joke after joke and giving it no no time to breathe or no no build up whatsoever? Because this is flawed from somewhere and I cannot pinpoint what is the source. I don't know. I mean, from my point of view, when I look at how this story is being told from the very beginning, I could tell that Ted was forced into this because... The passion that we read in some of his other issues were not there. It's like, it's, how to put it? Um, it's unfair for me to say, but it felt like it was just another paycheck. To talk about where the, the issue springs from, I think it all comes down to the sirens' motives. We don't know their motive beyond, uh, we want to be famous. And yeah, the, the despair or the conflict is tasty, but mostly they just want everyone seeing their adulation. Now, truth and truth be told in the movie, the first thing Adagio really says is, we're going to use that power to make everyone love us. But there's so much greater conflict in the movie. This one's just everyone saying, no, I wanna, I wanna represent them. I want to hire them. Okay. So someone hires them, conflict over. Okay. 
we're, we're good. There's no greater threat here, which is why when Star Swirl, after that two page of absurdity that will either charm or uh, re- repulse you, Star Swirl just says, okay, here's the magic mirror. Sorry, ladies. Boop. I don't like, did no one say, dude, <laughs> didn't she even give him a trial? Or yeah. the prince? Okay. Oh, and also Canterlot, I, I guess it shouldn't exist yet, but. You mean? Well, no, it does. It, it does take place in Canterlot. Of course it exists. It's there it, in the sign over there. And they yeah, go but here's, here. We're going but to Canterlot. But if we're going by, uh, by, uh, comic book canon, Canterlot was built after Luna was banished. And that was, a- after Star Swirl's time, apparently. Yeah, so I'm just like, a, okay. Yeah, of course. So, okay, maybe, maybe there was a cancel out there and they just did one heck of a renovation. <laughs> but I just thought, is he just zapped three living beings into an unknown future? Is anyone going to say, hey, uh, Star Swirl, I'm going to need your keys. <laughs> go go home, you're drunk on power. <laughs> I just, I boggle at this. And then the curious thing is that at the very end, after the sirens have been banished because they won, yeah, the great star swirl, he's berating himself that he couldn't make, he couldn't have uh, converted them with friendship because, you know, that, that would have helped, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They land in the human world dressed as they are at the start of Rainbow Rocks. (laughs) In modern times. In modern times. And I'm wondering about this. People were wondering, well, Sunset was obviously gone longer than the three years that uh, we see her photos at the high school. I'm wondering if that mirror doesn't just take you through space, but also time <laughs> to, to a, to a very condensed time period. It's, it's, it's like the, it's like that planet with the giant tidal waves in interstellar. Like every oh hour that passes in that planet is like 27 years on earth. <laughs> so it's something that, that's, like that. that's what I've been telling. Or that's what I've been um, talking to James about the implication of how time works with uh, the Equestria Girls universe and the normal pony universe because in the pony universe it's like what ancient Greece or something like that before Luna's banishment or after probably in between so when they got banished into Equestria Girls they became well teenage girls and if you think about it from the movie's point of view they got sent, well, during the same time, probably. And they have been teenage girls for a long time now. How does time pass? That's what I want to know. How does time work? How do you, how do you time? Oh, yeah, that's true. So if we, if we follow that, that means that, uh, the main six had been waiting in front of the mirror for Twilight to return in the first Equestria Girls movie for like several, several decades. Not really, because if you think <laughs> about it, right? Remember in our, Thanks for the memories review. I'm not sure if we want to start talking about this. I don't care. I want, I want to talk this. something better. God damn it. You, you, yeah, but it doesn't follow the comic, actually, because if you notice, we are drifting away from the comic so much. <laughs> We're not even talking about it anymore. We are not even acknowledging it as, a, as an entity. It doesn't exist. It's uh, not there. Uh, so, although, I'm just trying to think. I do, I do want to say that this comic finally does something uh, for the benefit of Canterlot snobbery. Mm-hmm. The world might have been saved if they'd been just a little bit more snobbish <laughs> from the, the sirens. That if the sirens were to conquer Twilight and Company and make it back to Equestria, just send Prince Blue Blood. <laughs> He'll probably not even listen to the music. Of course, he won't actually resort to physical violence. You know, it'd just sort of be an endless wave of him talking down to them and them trying to sing. Oh, God. When I mentioned at the beginning of the review right away that this is Drek, that this is actually a terrible comic. It is. It is a terrible comic. Uh, but it is a terrible comic because the few flaws that it has are massive. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a few things that I will salvage from it. Like I said, the first five pages of the comic are actually pretty interesting. I like the way that, that the world is presented before it all goes thrown under the truck and gets thrown over constantly. But the one thing that remains constant and good throughout the comic is actually the character of Starshul the Bearded, at least on the way that he's drawn and the way that he's presented. I think that you you did write it on your journal, uh, Silver, when you said that Starshul is like a ponified version of Leslie Nielsen, where he plays it very straightforward despite that 
he is a dorky horse playing dorky, <laughs> dorky with dorky musical instruments and dorky uh, uh, music styles. Yep. He might be the funniest. He's the funniest part of this comic, but it's not enough. Mm-hmm. It, de- it definitely doesn't in salvage it. The only reason why I am rereading this comic is so I am reviewing it with you guys. I have no, no motives. To open this up again. Oh, yeah. Now I very, I very much regret having to buy it on, on physical format, <laughs> but that's the problem with pre-orders. <laughs> uh, especially when you order them in banks and they give you discounts for it, so. Uh, take it or leave But it. if I knew, if I knew, if I knew it, I wouldn't have bothered. Not at all. Yeah. Anyway, that was a train wreck. What's next week's review? Yeah, let's talk about next a, week's a, review. A slightly less train wreck, but still. <laughs> uh, there is a major derail, and her name is Doran. <laughs> In case you don't haven't guessed yet, we are going to be reviewing Finship is Magic issue number four, where we are going to follow Nightmare Moon, written by Heather Neufer, with art by Tony Flix and colors by Heather Breckel. Will this be enough to wash out the, the bad taste left after this comic? We can only find out. You guys see you on next week's re- well next next review. Don't know if it's going to be next week or or not yet. I don't we're know. We're still deciding on how we're going to spread this out. Mm. So hope you guys enjoyed this one, even though it was short. And I will see you next time. This has been James Cork. I am not even going to sing anymore. <laughs> Good. And are and are we seriously not going to talk about the clot mention? Seriously? <laughs> no. 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 We're, no. Oh, that's on the After Dark show where we are going to be uploading it on Horse News where they can see all. No. Of yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, stepping boundaries. I need to get fired soon. <laughs> uh, no. See you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody. Bye bye. Adios. Not even that's was... gonna save this episode, man. I was missing that from the previous issue, actually. Somebody have to hear it again. <laughs> Can we hear it again, please? Let's just keep hearing it over and over and over. Oh, yeah. Uh. Oh, that's fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>